order. David T.C. Davis to move the motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Moon. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, and I'm pleased to bring forward the motion today that the government has considered the response of the return to the UK of Mr. Shakarama. Uh, Mrs. Moon, my interest in this matter stemmed from uh, various press reports, such as this one here from the BBC, at the time of Mr. Arma's return, which suggested that he would be entitled to a large and secretive sum of compensation, allegedly in the region of £1 million, and that this would apparently be in line with compensation uh, of similar amounts that have been paid to previous inmates of Guantanamo Bay who have returned to the UK. I wrote to the uh, Minister about this, and as always, he uh, wrote back to me very swiftly and very directly, and I'm very uh, grateful to him for that. Um, in fact, I could almost read out the whole letter. I won't do that, but, uh, but it's only a couple of sentences long. I think the, the, important, uh, the important sentence here is that um, in 2010, Kenneth Clark, the then Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, made a statement in the House of Commons. And he noted that Her Majesty's Government had inherited the issues around the treatment of UK detainees held by other countries from previous governments, and that these issues needed to be addressed. And he goes on to say... Uh, that uh, to that end, Mr. Clark informed the House that the government has now agreed a mediated settlement of the civil damages claims brought by detainees held at Guantanamo Bay. The details of that settlement have been made subject to a legally binding confidentiality uh, agreement. Now, I'd written, of course, to the Minister asking for um, confirmation that Mr. Shakarama would not be entitled to money, and this is the response I got. So I think it's fair for me to assume from this uh, that Mr. Armour actually will be in line for substantial damages. Uh, if the Minister wants to intervene at any time and tell me this is not so and categorically rule that, that out, then I'll be quite happy to cut this debate very short and, uh, and uh, finish it now. Yes, of course. Uh, I wish to uh, thank my friend for giving away and also I wish to congratulate the honourable friend, the member for Monmouth, for securing this important debate. It seems quite incredible, does it not, that on a day when the Chancellor has to announce uh, difficult decisions in the, uh, the spending review, uh, that many of my constituents will be horrified at the thought of compensation being paid to Mr. Amar. I just wonder if my honourable friend would like to reflect on that for a moment. I think I can uh, certainly reflect on that. I think your constituents would be absolutely right, and I can say that I am horrified at the prospect that this is going to happen. In my view, it is completely and utterly wrong that he should be entitled to any compensation. Let me just set out... Of course I will. Um, would my uh, honourable friend agree uh, that there is a lot of credit to be given to the government and other groups who fought for 14 years for the release of uh, this resident of Britain, Shaka Ama, and that compensation can never, nothing can ever compensate somebody for the loss of liberty without charge for 14 years, but that if compensation of a monetary value should be given, surely it is the US government that should be giving it. Well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on what other people have done, but certainly I think the Honourable Lady is right to say that if anybody is going to be paying compensation, it shouldn't be the British taxpayer, given the enormous uh, amount of time and money that uh, British officials have spent trying to secure his freedom. So let me just set out some of the generally accepted facts that relate to this matter. Mr Armour is a Saudi citizen not a British citizen at all. He was born in 1968. He moved to the UK in 1996 and subsequently got married here. He was given indefinite right uh, to remain here uh, and submitted an application for British citizenship. Before that went through, he decided in 2001 to leave, to move to Afghanistan, which at the time, of course, was run by uh, the extreme uh, Islamic Taliban uh, government. Um, now, let me just, sorry, sorry about this. Um, uh, basically, he, he decided to, uh, to move over there. He was, while he was over there, uh, the war broke out in 2001. Um, and he was able to get his family out of Afghanistan. But he chose to stay there. And uh, in, I believe, November, he was kidnapped by Afghan nationals and handed over to American nationals who imprisoned him. Now, on the basis of this, I fail to see why it is that the British taxpayer should become responsible for handing over to him a cheque for £1 million. 
he may be completely innocent of terrorist activity, but he certainly chose to embark on a very risky course of action of his own volition. Mm. Now, I've, yes, I will. Um, I would ask, uh, Honourable Friend, that uh, this is a very good place to scrutinise uh, your debate, but not perhaps the appropriate place to put somebody on trial who was not put on trial for 14 years. Uh, well, the Honourable Lady uh, is probably right, but I'm not putting him on trial. I'm, uh, I've actually given the generally accepted facts. He, he chose to come to the United Kingdom he, as a Saudi citizen. He got married here. He put in an application to become a British citizen, and before that application went through, he moved to Afghanistan. He apparently preferred to live in Afghanistan in 2001. He was captured by Afghan nationals from the Northern Alliance, and he was handed over to the Americans. There's no doubt about any of that. So, um, you know, I'm just quoting the facts. He may be completely innocent of any activity in terrorism, and I'm going to assume that he is for the time being. Great. My honourable friend, um, yes. I, I appreciate very much um, that clarification. Um, unfortunately, what some facts we are not, uh, have not yet been proven, mm. as I'm sure Honourable Friend knows, and the Minister might give us more information, is the question of any torture and any presence of British people during that torture. Uh, therefore, there are many complicated issues with this particular case. Well, there are, certainly, um, there are certainly a lot of facts that have yet to come out, and I might give reference to a few myself in a minute. But let me just turn to... Um, the, uh, the then Lord Chancellor's statement, because uh, this is the statement that was made in 2010. Um, and he makes a couple of points. He basically sets out why it is he's going to make the large payments to the previous Guantanamo Bay inmates who'd returned to the UK. And I, I'm, I'm not going to try and read this out, but to sum it up, uh, he said that the Gibson inquiry would not be able to begin until these claims had been resolved. Well, my first question to that is, why not? Um, I don't see why... Uh, outstanding claims should stop an inquiry from being set up. There may be a reason, but in any case, the Gibson inquiry subsequently ended uh, because nobody was apparently satisfied that it was going to be impartial. So there is no Gibson inquiry now. So that particular problem is not going to occur in the case of Mr. Armour. Uh, the second point that Mr. Clark made was uh, he said very clearly that he felt that there was absolutely no admission of culpability in any of the matters that the Honourable Lady, for example, has just referred to. Well, if we're not culpable of any, uh, as a government or as a country, of any uh, misdeeds in the cases of these people, then why on earth are we not saying so and fighting the court cases? Uh, if there is any culpability, then it certainly isn't any minister from this government or indeed the previous coalition government. The, the blame would rest with someone else, and it is someone else who should be held accountable for it, not the British taxpayer. Uh, the, I certainly will. Thank you, uh, Mr Moon. I, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for giving way, and he's making a very compelling speech. Um, what does my honourable friend think that the families of our brave armed forces who lost their lives in Afghanistan will think about this news? Well, I, I think the honourable member makes an absolutely excellent point, and I'm going to come to that in a minute, um, because oh. there are three uh, in that position in, in Monmouthshire. Um, just, just one other thing here, that the, the, the then Chancellor, the, then Mr Clark, made the point uh, that fighting a court case, he said, was estimated at approximately 30 to 50 million pounds over three to five years of litigation. Now, you know, uh, that is a very high figure, and I find it hard to believe, but I'm not a legal man. But in any case, if this government, if we're right, uh, then we should fight these cases. We shouldn't simply have a situation where people can pitch up and say, I'm going to sue the government for a million pounds, uh, and it will cost you more than that to uh, defend the case, so you're going to have to give me the money. This government should be a government of principles, and if we believe that we're in the right, we should fight these cases and not simply hand out checks to people. I certainly will. Thank you, my old friend, for giving away. Just on that point, I wonder whether or not the figure of 30 to 50 million, I believe, he just quoted, mm -hmm. actually is in relationship to actually fought a case and lost that case. What would be the figure if actually we fought the case and won? David T.C. Ex Davis. Exactly, and I wonder how much of that 30 to 50 million would be the, uh, the cost being submitted by uh, the lawyers working for um, the, these people. Actually, the statement doesn't make that clear, so I can't, um, I can't comment. But, it's a, but, but the gen honourable gentleman makes um, uh, a, a very good point. Now, I think that uh, if the government actually showed a willingness to go to court, then it might well be that Mr. Armour's extremely expensive lawyers would think twice about bringing the case. And there's certainly an implication of that in this and other press reports, the one from the BBC, 
uh, where Mr Stafford Smith, the, one of the main lawyers involved, said that he implied that he wasn't going to bother suing the Americans because he had no chance of getting uh, money out of them. As far as I'm concerned, let his lawyers fight for their money in Britain. Let the minister and the government do everything in their power to stop them uh, from getting it. Uh, there are facts that uh, I think need to come out here. Mr Armour himself obviously felt that the extreme brand of Islam favoured by the Taliban at the time was preferable to anything on offer in the UK. He chose to go out there. He was apparently... Oh, hang on, I will give way in a moment. But perhaps the Honourable Lady, if she knows anything about it, can clarify this. He claims that he was working for a charity. I have scoured the internet. I've looked at every report I can from everybody I can that have had an interest in this. And I've not been able to find out anywhere the name of this, this charity. Right. As mentioned before, my honourable friend, I think there are lots of principles here at stake and I think it's very worthy of us to debate them, but I don't believe we are here to put somebody on trial who was in prison for 14 years without any trial, without that person present here today as well. Would he please stick to the principles uh, of this very worthy debate uh, and avoid putting Mr Shaka Amma on trial here today? David well, I'm not T. C. putting him Davis. on trial, but if his lawyer wants to come out and tell us more about this charity that he was working for, his lawyer should do so. He's had plenty of opportunities. I mean, I'll give away once to the Honourable Lady, but, you know, lots of people have been saying lots of things in defence of Mr. Arna. Nobody's been telling us about this charity uh, that he was working for. If the Honourable Lady knows anything about it, do enlighten us. The Honourable Gentleman, yes, I, I do have information, but... It does need to be uh, in a court of law if it is relevant. I don't believe it is uh, valuable here. I believe if you do need this conversation, then the lawyer must be here, Mr. Shaka Amma must be here, and we must go back 14 years when a trial should have taken place. No, I disagree with the Honourable Lady. If, if she knows what the name of the charity was, then she should say so. It's not listed anywhere else. And while she's at it, she ought to try and find out, and the lawyer ought to explain why he was apparently arrested on a fake Belgian passport when he was in Afghanistan. Because that's not normally, you know, fake passports aren't normally de rigueur when one is doing uh, at work for aid agencies. I will give way. Slaughter. But he really perhaps should abide what his honourable friend, the point that, that, that she is making on member for Twickenham. Is he not abusing his position here and taking advantage of privilege to try and put on trial a man who spent 14 years in custody without ever having allegations proved against him or being put on, on trial. Isn't this a matter that where due process should take its course? I hope that's what the minister is going to tell us. And, to, and to, frankly, to try and besmirch this man's name after everything he's been through is really quite a disgraceful thing to do. And, to, and it takes advantage of parliamentary privilege to do well, so. Well, do you know, I mean, PC I'm Davis. amazed by what the Honourable Gentleman is saying, because this is surely relevant. If he was, a re if he, if he was in possession of a fake Belgian passport, then that is something that needs to be discussed. I'm not besmirching him. I'm not even saying he was. I'm saying it was widely reported and not been denied. So the second point is, I'm saying there's a lot of information that's been put out there about him by his lawyers, amongst others, but nobody is sought fit to tell us what the name of the charity he was working for was. So let's go back to the... Well, no, no, I think I've given away a few times. Let's go back to the... Well, let me just... Let, OK, if the Honourable Gentleman knows the name of the charity, let's have it. It's a... I make two very quick points. The ah, first right. is so he the, the cha that, that Shakram himself has not had the opportunity to put his side of the story. I'm sure he will do it some case, and therefore this is at the very least premature. The Honourable Gentleman is entitled to ask about due process, he's entitled to question the Minister about the way that the government conducts litigation. Uh, in my uh, uh, humble opinion, he is not entitled to come here and to attack a man who has suffered grievously uh, and has not been shown due process and to add insult to injury by what he's doing today. Well, the the Honourable Gentleman Davis. can relax because I'm not attacking him at all. If I was attacking him, the Honourable Gentleman would know about it. I'm just raising a few questions. I mean, when I'm in attack mode, uh, I'm in attack mode and I'm not in attack mode. I'm actually taking it. I I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. No, I'm not in smear mode at all. The Honourable Gentleman, that is... Can, can I just chamber. say, you know, I find this absolutely extraordinary. These are perfectly reasonable questions to ask, given that this man is about to receive apparently £1 million of taxpayers' money in secret, which I think is outrageous. Three young men from Monmouthshire have lost their lives fighting in Afghanistan. They didn't choose to go there. They didn't go and choose to live under this extremist, Islamo-fascist state that Mr Armour decided was, was, a, was a worthy state to go and live under. They were asked to go there by the British government. Now, what I've got here, and the Honourable Gentleman next to me made some proper points in this. These are the, this is the list of what people will get paid if they receive serious injuries 
in, in, the defense of their, in the defense of their country. And the absolute maximum you can get if you've lost both arms and both legs is £570,000. This is for people who've been doing their duty for this country. This man, Mr. Armour, who is not a British citizen at all, who was given the right to come over to this country um, because of our generous sort of way, whose family, as I understand it, have been looked after by the state ever since he disappeared off to Afghanistan with him. No, I'm not giving way again. I'm not giving way again because I asked a gentleman to answer a straightforward question last time, and he said he was going to, and then he didn't. So let me just finish by saying this. It is absolutely outrageous that British servicemen and women who lose arms and legs in Afghanistan fighting those Islamo-fascists at the time when they launched those disgraceful attacks on New York, while Mr. Arm was apparently out there by choice, working for some sort of charity out there, allegedly, um, is now going to get almost twice as much money. He's not a British citizen. He chose to go and live in a foreign country. He was kidnapped by other members of some other militia in said foreign country. He was put in prison in another foreign country. And it is wrong that the British taxpayer should be expected to pick up the bill for this. The question is that this House has considered the government's response to the return to the UK of Mr Sheikh Armour. Minister Hayes. Thank you, uh, Mrs Moon. And you will appreciate, and I know that my honourable friend will, who's brought this debate, uh, that there are some things that I can deal with straightforwardly in this debate, but some matters which are uh, not appropriate to raise, which are subject to uh, uh, proceedings that wouldn't be appropriate, and obviously any security matters that I am not able to raise, I, he will appreciate, given his experience in this House, uh, I know that he won't test me on. Um, I, I'm grateful to our gentleman for uh, bringing this debate to the House. Um, he is the last UK resident, uh, Shekharama, to be released from Guantanamo Bay. Um, as my honourable friend will be aware, Mr. Armour was released went, and returned to the UK on the 30th of October into Biggin Hill Airport. Other members uh, have secured debates on the case earlier this year, seeking his release. And as you will know, Mrs. Moon, there has been an all party parliamentary group on Shekharama. Uh, and uh, they will uh, have made their arguments. Uh, those arguments are now, of course, in the context of his release, but I appreciate there are others in this House, and the gentleman clearly is one of them, uh, who may seek to question why this government uh, went about trying to seek uh, his return to the United Kingdom. Would the Honourable gentleman just give way? Well, I'll just make, if I just well, might, I, forgive me, I will just make this fundamental point, because I think we can find a synthesis uh, across this uh, chamber uh, if we all understand this point. The indefinite detention without fair trial is fundamentally unacceptable. It's not only central to our view of legal process, but more than that, the ethical framework on what, which that process is built. And it is an a priori assumption that detention without trial is unacceptable. And I'm absolutely certain my little friend is about to intervene on me is going to agree with that. Well, well, David T.C. Davis. Actually, I was just going to point out with the greatest respect to my honourable friend, who I've known for a long time, that that's not what I've raised here. I'm not making any comment about his detention. I'm making a comment about the prospect of him receiving £1 million and in secret, a secret payment of a million pounds or, 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 or thereabouts. That's what I'm raising today. Well, yes, I, that, that may be, uh, of course, that, that is not a question, maybe. That is what the Honourable Gentleman has raised in part, but it is impossible to consider that out of the context of the circumstances which prevail in respect of uh, Shaka Armour. And the, uh, the belief that I have, I, I'm sure my honourable friend shares it, I think the whole chamber will share it, uh, is that the fairness of any judicial system uh, is vital to its popular acceptance, and the unintended consequence of Guantanamo Bay is to create a perception of unfairness, and that that potentially fuels uh, distaste for hostility towards the US and her allies. With that in mind, the UK government was committed to making best endeavours to bring Mr Armour back to the UK. Representations on his behalf were therefore made by government ministers at the most senior levels, including the Prime Minister to President Obama, uh, in which the UK position was made very clear, and I think the whole chamber will be aware of that because it's the subject of some 
publicity. Uh, the fact that the US administration agreed to review Mr. Armour's case as a priority and then release him demonstrates once again our close ties. Following the return of Mr. Armour to the UK, uh, it's important to emphasise, I think, that the UK is not considering accepting any further detainees from Guantanamo Bay. Um, the timetable for the closure of that facility hasn't come up, but I know honourable members will be mindful of it. it remains a matter for the US government, uh, and it's a matter of which President Obama, I know you all know Mrs Moon, has commented on a number of times. In respect of Mr Armour, officials in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and across government worked to ensure that the return happened in a way that was quick and secure. I will happily give away, yeah. Uh, thank you. In, in view of the title of this motion, uh, can the Minister tell us if the government is looking into the allegations that UK personnel may have been present, may have been present at times of torture, whether in Afghanistan or in Guantanamo, uh, when torture was administered to Mr Shaka Ama? Well, I, I heard the Honourable Lady raise the same point earlier in the debate. Um, uh, my Honourable Friend took um, uh, well, well I haven't, I, just in a moment, if I might say something, I'm afraid, I want to deal with one intervention. I'm, I'm not sufficiently accomplished to remember all the interventions and then do them in sequence. <laughs> so I just need to do them one by one, you'll understand. The, um, uh, the, the Honourable Lady's uh, uh, made her point and put it on record, but she must know it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on the details of anyone involved in alleged uh, events in Guantanamo Bay, and I certainly can't do so in this debate. Uh, I give way to my other friend. The Honourable Gentleman does not agree that these allegations of torture are also allegations and that if they're being raised, um, they are besmirching the American uh, government and that, uh, you know, I've got as much right to raise the issue as to why he was out there on a false passport working for a charity I can't find anything out about as uh, the people have to suggest he was tortured when he got there. These are all allegations and that's it. Well, with combination assiduity, perspicacity and good hearing, my honourable friend personifies, you would have heard me use the phrase anyone involved in these alleged events. Um, now, returning to my script, uh, I understand that the public will have concerns in respect of a former detainee of Guantanamo Bay returning to the UK and the potential security implications this may bring. And my honourable friend has articulated uh, some of that today. But it's important for me to say I cannot comment on why Mr. Arm was detained in the first instance, or provide any details, as I said at the outset of the debate, uh, on security arrangements in this individual case. It has been a long tradition of successive governments not to do so, and it would be uh, entirely inappropriate for me to break with that tradition today, given the sensitivity of the matters we are considering. However, I would want to reassure the whole of this chamber, Mrs. Moon, uh, that uh, it is the first duty of government to protect the security of citizens, a duty that we take extremely seriously. Any individual seeking to engage in terrorist-related activity should be in no doubt whatsoever the relevant authorities will take the strongest possible action to protect our national security and ensure they are brought to justice. Recent events around the world, particularly so close in Paris, have demonstrated that the threat remains both real, severe and dynamic. It, the, the Chamber won't be oblivious to the fact that both the Prime Minister and the uh, director of MI5 have made absolutely clear that seven uh, serious uh, events have been uh, avoided uh, through the work of uh, our security services and police. We foiled no fewer than seven different terrorist plots in the last uh, year alone. So that, I think, is ample illustration of both the urgency, severity, and character of, what, of the work uh, we are doing. And police and security intelligence agencies already have a range of powers available, and stretching from prosecution for criminal offences relating to terrorism through to executive disruption powers such as the imposition of terrorist, terrorism prevention investigation measures, so-called TPIMs. In respect of dealing with the issue of Syria, we have a right range of powers to disrupt travel and manage the risk posed by returnees. These include the ability to temporarily seize and retain travel documents to disrupt the immediate travel and the creation of a temporary exclusion order which enables the UK government to temporarily disrupt and control an individual's return to the UK. Of course, there will be those who criticise some of these measures as an infringement of civil liberties. But I disagree. They are protecting precious freedoms from terrorists who want to steal them from us. Our legislation is robust and because of our determination to get the balance right, those powers are matched with appropriate checks and balances, uh, safeguards and judicial oversight. 
we remain confident that our law enforcement intelligence agencies have the tools available to deal with those who seek to threaten the United Kingdom. Now, there have been comments uh, in the media reflected by my honourable friend's debate and speech today uh, about any potential payments which may be made to Mr Armour. I would refer those present to the statement uh, referred to indeed by my honourable friend made by the then uh, Lord Chancellor the, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, November the 16th, 2010, in which he stated the government have now agreed a, a mediated settlement of the civil damages claims brought by detainees at Guantanamo Bay. The details of that settlement have been made subject to a legally binding confidential agreement. Indeed, I'm, I'm uh, repeating what my honourable friend said, and he wouldn't expect me to go further than that today. Uh, I, I know. Would you, would you know yes. David T.C. Davis. Could you tell me, why does this need to be secret? Uh, well, because as the statement I've just read out said, this is subject to a uh, binding confidentiality why, agreement, uh, and this is not uncommon in law. The Honourable Gentleman is a distinguished parliamentarian and an uh, authority on a number of matters, and he will know it's not uncommon to have confidentiality agreements in those kind of cases. Now, the government said, the Honourable Gentleman said uh, that, um, uh, that, that made that statement at the time, the then Justice Secretary, uh, that the uh, government had inherited the issues around the treatment of UK detainees held by other countries from previous governments, and that these issues needed to be addressed for failure to do so would mean that a reputation as a country that believes in the rule of law, the fairness I described, Arla, risks being tarnished. Uh, as was also set out in their statement, no admissions of culpability were made in settling the claims, and none of the claimants withdrawn the allegations. It was a mediated settlement where confidentiality is a common feature, and I'm therefore unable to provide any further comments on legal action brought by those intended in Canada's guy than that which has already been provided by the statement. Um, I do, would just say, of course, that it is open to Mr. Armour to bring a damages claim in the US. This was raised during the course of our considerations, and that's a matter for the US justice system. Uh, I cannot comment on, uh, on that, and I can't comment on what, what his, he plans to do, because, of course, I don't know what he plans to do. So, in conclusion, Mrs Moon, I reiterate that the UK has long held that uh, indefinite detention without trial is fundamentally unacceptable because it is unreasonable and unfair, and the rule of law depends on popular acclaim. It pretends us all believing that we will be treated fairly, properly, and equally, if I might say so. My honourable friend will know the Prime Minister has asked the Intelligence Security Committee of Parliament to examine the themes and issues set out in the detainee inquiry report, which was published by the government in December 2013. I have outlined as far as I can Mr Armour's immigration status and the measures in place to deal with any individual engaging in terrorist-related activity. In addition, I have reminded those present the statement of the former Justice Secretary on damages claims brought by those detained in Guantanamo Bay and mediated settlement that follows. I know that my honourable friend will be pleased he's had the opportunity of putting these matters on record. I know that he feels very strongly about them. Uh, and uh, he will, I hope, with, with that respect, the respect I offer him for having done so, respect my position in not being, ad not being able to add further to these matters on this occasion in this House. The question is that this House has considered the government's response to the return to the UK of Mr. Shaker Armour. As many of that opinion say aye, of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order.